Ladies and gentlemen, I request you to kindly take your seats for the next session. Shaping the New World Order, Hussein Haqqani, James Crabtree, John Kay, and Suki Kim in conversation with Sashi Kumar. Hussein Haqqani served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States from 2008 to 2011 and is widely credited with managing a difficult partnership during a critical phase in the global war on terrorism. Considered an expert on radical Islamist movements, he is now director for South and Central Asia at Hudson Institute in Washington, DC. James Crabtree is a writer, journalist, and author living in Singapore. He is currently an associate professor of practice at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and a senior fellow at the School Center on Asia and Globalization. His first book, The Billionaire Raj, A Journey Through India's New Gilded Age, was published in July 2018. John Kay has been writing about India for over 40 years. His India, A History 2000 and 2010, published, is the standard narrative account of South Asia's past, while India Discovered, 1981 and still in print, has inspired a generation of research into the 19th century reconstruction of India's classical past. His latest work is an intriguing biographical quest, The Tartan Turban in Search of Alexander Gardner. Suki Kim is a South Korea-born American investigative journalist, novelist, and the only writer ever to have lived undercover in North Korea for immersive journalism. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Without You, There Is No Us, Undercover Among the Sons of North Korean Elite which is a literary investigative uh, documentation of North Korea's most important recent history. Sashi Kumar is a print and broadcast journalist, filmmaker, and media entrepreneur. He founded and chairs the Media Development Foundation, which administers the Asian College of Journalism. He was among the earliest newscasters in English on national television, Doordarshan, Middle East correspondent of the Hindu, and news anchor on Radio Bahrain in the mid-1980s. The session, Shaping the New World Order. Hello and good afternoon. So we have a very serious job ahead of us, shaping the new world order. After the last session, and that's quite a formidable task. Just a few decades back, the world seemed a more certain place in some ways. Not a desirable place necessarily, or more than desirable than now, but more certain. There were certainties. You had the Cold War. Uh, you had Western liberalism, you had socialism, they seemed to be in contest. And then the Cold War ended, socialism and communism, I think, uh, was on the back foot, took a beating, if I might call it that, and we had the emergence of a unipolar world. Things looked hunky-dory for Western or democratic liberalism, so much so that Francis Fukuyama, in the 1990s, early 1990s, wrote that uh, proposition about the end of history and the last man, suggesting that liberal democracy is going to ride into the sunset like in one of those cowboy movies, and we're all, all going to live happily ever after with liberal democracy. Somewhere in the middle of that decade, we had, in fact, a reminder of that. Hollywood is a good kind of index of how things change. Uh, without the Cold War, in fact, Hollywood was plotless for a while. But they keep reinventing the Cold War, even when it's over, so that you can have this contest going on on the screens. And I remember somewhere in the 1990s, 95 or 96, I'm not sure, there was this film called Independence Day, 
the plot of the film was that there's an aerial invasion, threat of an aerial invasion on Earth. Actual invasion takes place. And no less than the President of the United States, who happens to be a wizard pilot, leads the counter. And after a lot of spatial warfare, the day is won again for humanity and the world. What's interesting is at the end of the film, this whole invasion takes place on the eve of American Independence Day, July the 4th. And so at the end of the film, you have the American president, who acts as the American president, giving a state of the world address, where he says, henceforth, July the 4th will be known as not American Independence Day, but World Independence Day. That was an indication of a new imperial order, and we all felt quite safe. We thought America is going to protect all of us. Suddenly, all that is again in shambles now, with a president who is not only shutting off America, but also shutting down the government of America. And we don't know what lies ahead. So liberal democracy, for one, is on the back foot. Democracy itself seems a, a questionable proposition. We don't know the future of democracy, of liberal democracy. There is, in fact, a, a Hungarian ruler, someone who is in charge of Hungary now, Viktor Orban, who says that what he is running is an illiberal democracy, a new state of illiberal democracy. He wears it on its sleeve. So illiberal democracy is not such a fantastic or shocking idea anymore. Democracy doesn't always come with the rider of liberalism. So we'll probably begin this uh, session with the experts that we have from different parts of the world, looking at different areas of the world, looking at what is the future of liberal democracy? What is the future of liberalism? What is the future of democracy at a time when we have uh, examples to the contrary, democratically elected examples to the contrary, beginning with Trump in the United States, with Erdogan in Turkey, closer home in Philippines, we have Duterte, uh, we have the Polish leader, Kaczynski, uh, we have in Hungary, as I said, Viktor Orban, and, and so many other examples. So I'd probably open this by asking Hussein Saab to tell us what is his macro view of where we are headed in terms of, future, of the future of democracy. Is democracy a tenable proposition at all? Or have we outlived democracy? Is it a quaint and a, an obsolete idea now? Well, let me just begin by saying that sometimes we, because we live in an era in which information is constantly in our face, uh, therefore we seem to take a very, think of ourselves as a camera, we take a very uh, limited, our aperture is very limited. So we assume that, you know, just this period is all, all, all that's important and in that context we uh, sort of speculate about the future without reference to the much bigger picture before us. The experience of democracy is a relatively shorter experience in relation to the overall cumulative experience of mankind. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, uh, yes, what we built uh, seems to be uh, on shaky foundation right now. Um, it's, uh, it's resulting in the notion of people who are uh, sort of who, who choose democracy as a means to power, but do not believe in the principles that created uh, the idea of, of, of pluralism and democracy. Uh, hence, the Orbans and the Erdogans of this world uh, who get elected, but that's their means of ascent. Uh, but in the cumulative human experience, let's be honest, uh, world order is a relatively new concept. Uh, before the Second World War, establishing world order was not easy. Uh, it was a, a multiple power centers, contention for power within countries, between countries. The Second World War presented a unique moment. Human beings could reflect on the cruelty of other human beings as a result of that cruelty having reached a really high point. Uh, one country, the United States of America, ended up having half the world's GDP at that point. Uh, military power was limited because everybody else was exhausted to two superpowers. And so a kind of world was shaped in which uh, calling somebody an internationalist was actually uh, a word of praise. Nowadays it's used as a term of denigration. Um, and so we had a few good years. Uh, 
But now we are back to what was essentially the human state of greater contention for power, of intolerance, mm. uh, of uh, 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 f being fearful and even antagonistic towards the other. Mm. And the technologies that enabled us to come closer and have globalization and internationalism led to a new round of technologies which are now being used to demolish all of it. Right. So, for example, the newspaper uh, is not a very old institution, just a few centuries, but the newspaper became a means of sharing news, sharing views, etc., etc., views that emanated from so Karl Marx sitting in London, but his views all of a sudden have followers. Um, I sometimes jokingly say in India, you know, they might be the last of the serious followers of Karl Marx so left, but, you know, th th there are people everywhere. Um, religions spreading more universally, uh, political beliefs, the whole argument of democracy f spreading much faster. Now, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram becoming means of actually dividing us because one thing was you printed one newspaper for everybody. Now what you are doing is you are figuring out through uh, the various kinds of uh, uh, technologies, you figure out what somebody's prejudices are, you play to those prejudices, and in the process, you augment those prejudices. So we are well, in that's for... Well, one function of internet. We, anyway, we, so we, yeah. we are in for a rough yeah. ride. Yeah, I know it's only one function, but yeah. it's the function that is shaping more of the... Uh, of the negative order that we are viewing the last three, four, five, six years, especially in terms of election results, in terms of opinions, Brexit may not have been possible if Britain only had an era of newspapers. Uh, That's Trump assuming you assume Brexit is bad. Uh, yes, of course. Yes, there are uh, lot, quite a few no, no, people. I'm not assuming. Not. I'm not assuming it's bad. I'm. I'm clearly stating that it is a reversal of internationalism and globalization. Right. Okay. And, and, and I'm not pronouncing good, bad. And I'm not going to get into this sort of relevant, uh, relativist debate. Sure. I'm just explaining what's happening. Sure. The structures that existed are coming are apart. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. So there's been globalization on the one hand, and on the other hand, you find fragmentation, you find nation statism, you find nationalisms cropping up, and these seem to be contending with one another. This is tension between the two. Uh, so, but what has happened is, what was a unipolar world is suddenly looking multilateral in inverted commas all over again because there are newer forces, newer power centers, there's China, uh, there is Russia of course, and the US is suddenly finding itself at odds with some of these powers. Uh, their writ doesn't, shall we say, run, uh, it may run large but not, doesn't run absolutely across the world. Uh, what, 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 James, would be your take on this? Um, well, I don't think it's controversial to say that the rise of China is the preeminent um, sort of fact of our age. I think we should remain surprised at how much the United States is doing to speed along that rise and how easy the United States is currently making, sort of playing into China's hands. So I now, I lived in Mumbai for five years and then moved to Singapore. And, and you look around Southeast Asia, which is in a sense the fulcrum of a new period of geopolitical competition, what Europe was to the latter 20th century, so Southeast Asia will be to the to this century, in a sense, this is the turf over which uh, the two big powers, and to some extent India, are going to compete for um, influence. And you see everybody is hedging their bets. Um, uh, Trump has weakened the American alliances, particularly with Korea and Japan, and has given a general sense that the United States is much less reliable than it used to be, and that it, both of those things are going to be very difficult to repair, even were Trump to get kicked out of office or lose an election in two years' time. It's going to be very hard to go back to the status quo ante. And so you see everybody hedging their bets. Uh, you've definitely seen that in India after the Doklam conflict with China, non-conflict sort of standoff, and then Modi's trip to Wuhan, even though in some ways India and Japan are most concerned about China's rise strategically, nonetheless, you know, they don't want to be the one that's caught out annoying the Chinese. And so they have, over the last year, you can see both of them, everyone in fact, has gradually been trying to work out how on earth do you position yourself between an erratic, unreliable America and an increasingly assertive China. 
Um, and so, I mean, I think Hussein's right. We're in for a rough ride. This is the new normal. There is an argument to be made if you're a country like India. At least America and China haven't bandied together and decided to divide the world up between them, and that gives you a bit more space to operate. But it means these two giants, whatever happens in the current trade war, are going to be competing with one another, um, and everyone else has to be, you know, looking that they don't get trampled underfoot. Yeah. Um, John, from what we see now, from what uh, Hussein and what uh, we heard from James, th there is the assumption, I think, although it may not be explicit, that uh, China as a new force uh, may be a threat as well. The United States probably, but is it not a good thing after all to have a counterbalance in some way? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm partly playing devil's advocate if you like. Um, an internet, for instance, I think one of the great things that internet has done is uh, empower people. Uh, there's been a huge kind of uh, uh, opening up of, of information, of communication. True, I think uh, a lot of hate speech, a lot of uh, fragmentation, a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, echo chambers and f filter bubbles are operating there which reinforce opinions and create prejudices and these are then freewheeling on the, on the net. But on the other side, it is a technology, it is a huge technological innovation and I don't see whether you can, how you can roll, roll the wave back. So, is liberal democracy, as we have assumed it, such a good thing after all? In fact, liberalism has been attacked both from the left and the right. Uh, the, the left has been impatient with, with liberalism for its own reasons. The right uh, is now, we find, impatient with liberalism. Uh, they think liberal democracy is not the way to go. Illiberal democracy, as O'Brien says, may be the way to go. Uh, we have seen how neoliberalism was a fashion after Thatcherite and Reaganite, uh, uh, you know, economic reforms or economic agendas. So, are we in a state of flux, which is not necessarily negative, out of which a new paradigm might emerge, is, is what I thought as a historian, as someone who looks, takes a step back and looks at these events might, might like to uh, look at. Yes, um, as someone who writes histories, I'm used to dealing with the past. I'm not very good at projecting what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my field. But I do think this is um, a very critical time. I mean, it's a critical time, as you were saying, in terms of the shift of the balance of power in the world uh, from uh, the, the United States and the uh, bipolar arrangement we've been accustomed to, to the emergence of China and a completely different world, world order. It's also a very critical time in terms of um, a liberal democracy, as you were saying, and the threat from... Um, uh, populist rhetoric and autocratic populist regimes. Um, and there is a sense in which maybe that tide has peaked or is about to peak uh, as um, following uh, the elections to the House of Representatives in the uh, United States, um, following or during this period in the UK when uh, the populist sort of movement that took us to the, the verge of Brexit. It looks as if it might be beginning to reverse. And similarly here in India, with uh, elections coming up and um, uh, Modi's rule uh, endangered maybe. Uh, so that maybe this, um, uh, this, this great wave of populism has, is, is peaking at the moment as we speak. And the other thing is that, uh, that really worries me is that when a sort of great powers are in decline, they tend to, do, to behave irresponsibly. Um, I'm thinking back to, say, 1956, uh, which uh, in the UK we, we, called the, it, we called it the Suez Crisis, when uh, the British and the French um, intervened in Egypt to try and prevent um, Colonel Nasser from nationalizing the Suez Canal and a small war was uh, fought and lost, really. Um, but it was a sort of adventure, a confrontation that was absolutely no need, need to get involved with. It could have been settled quite amicably with some re-sharing re, uh, of the fees from uh, ship, shipping using the canal. Um, and I think there is a danger at the moment with um, Donald Trump um, having lost control of the House of Representatives and with only two years to go before he has to stand again for election, taking some very risky initiatives, 
maybe somewhere, maybe in the South China Sea, maybe in Venezuela, who knows? So as I say, this is a very critical moment for all these reasons that you've been saying. And I think, uh, well, I mean, as a writer of history, I know never to, I always expect to be surprised, but uh, as someone looking into the future, I'm certain we're going to be surprised. All right. Uh, Suki, as someone who looks at uh, all of these areas, of course, but if I might draw your attention particularly to what's happening in uh, the US vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, that's a huge initiative that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's uh, staring us in the face. And uh, what Trump is uh, about is not very clear, but it does seem that like some initiative, some breakthrough may be in the offing. Um, how do you see uh, dealing with uh, a regime like North Korea as part of the emerging uh, kind of configuration of, uh, of, of the world order? Well, is this working? Um, well, with North Korea, it's actually, um, it's unbelievable how neither uh, liberal or uh, far right side, I mean, conservatives mattered. You know, it's a rogue state that it's been apart from the rest of the world for, um, since the creation of North Korea. And the creation of North Korea was the result of the Cold War uh, between the United States and Soviet Union. And now the existence of North Korea has a lot to do with the Cold War between China and the United States. So it seems that North Korea just is simply in its own place and is in many sense sacrificed by the uh, regional powers. I did cover the Singapore summit. I went to Singapore. Uh, remember when um, Trump and Kim Jong-un met uh, in June last year? What was that all about, for example? Um, no one knows what that was about. <laughs> that was the whole point, in a way. And um, you know, we're talking about a second summit coming up. So in this whole North Korea within the region, like what is really happening? Why do we think it's actually something positive is happening? And Trump is taking a lot of credit for bringing Kim Jong-un to give up nuclear power and bringing peace to the region. But what happened that that, I mean, is that really happening? You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing how all of that is sort of our impression. It goes back to what you were saying, what media does, or, you know, media creates a perception of supposedly peace on the Korean Peninsula, but actually nothing has happened except a lot of talks and a lot of post um, a photo op. So South Korea, for example, Moon Jae-in, the president, um, his whole agenda is about bringing peace to the peninsula. So he met with Kim Jong-un at the DMZ. If you remember, there was a whole Olympics uh, in South Korea and last spring, and there were a lot of uh, friendly gestures between North Korea. But in reality, North Korea has not given up nuclear weapons. And in reality, nothing actually happened. So, but we do get this impression of peace on the peninsula, and a lot of it goes directly back to what each leader needs. Moon Jae-in was facing, at the time, parliamentary election within South Korea. So it's about the election. Mm -hmm. um, Trump is also, North Korea is a big distraction from his own Russia investigation and also in the now upcoming um, election, you know, to be re-elected. So I think that when we're talking about the democracy in the region, it's more about actually each country and what it needs. Does it ultimately bring peace in the region? At what cost? On a really urgent subject like North Korea, which United Nations just announced as a prison state, um, it's really like, it's kind of the worst state in the world currently, North Korea, as a good luck nation. Um, I think the cost is the suffering of the people. Mm -hmm. That's not changing, hasn't changed a single bit in the last 70 years. Right. One thing we have noticed, though, is in the practice of democracy, there has been a lot of democracy that's emanating from the street. Uh, I mean, it's, I'm not, not just referring to the Arab Spring or the color res, revol, revolutions, Orange Revolution, uh, Rose Revolution, and so on, uh, in Ukraine and uh, other places, uh, Georgia, and so on. Uh, but, but also the fact, for instance, in South Korea itself, you had people taking to the streets, and uh, Park uh, Gune had to, had to, I mean, she, she, she had to leave, and I think she's, she's in a correctional center in Seoul, if I'm not mistaken now. So you've had people forcing the issue, 
there's some sense of direct democracy operating. Sometimes this looks uh, dangerous. Sometimes it looks, uh, you know, li like uh, almost anarchic. At other times, it looks like a like a correction at the right time, remedial. Uh, in other words, the, app the apparatuses that we take for granted, the representative apparatuses that we take for granted in a democracy, uh, cannot anymore be taken for granted. It looks like there's a kind, the whole thing is in a state of flux. And I think internet and the whole technology of the media, digital revolution and so on, is also an extension of that, if you like, dovetails into that. Uh, how people are acting on that, how there's a kind of assertion of empowerment there. Uh, sometimes for the bad, as you point out, I'm mean, sometimes uh, not so healthy, but, some, but I think overall, I, I, I tend to believe it's overall uh, empowering people, making them more uh, put their destiny in their own hands in some ways. But how would this will fi pan out is, is, is anybody's guess. Yeah, no, you, you, you first of all, I think we should try and sort of make a distinction between what is and what we want to think it is. For example, the Arab Spring hasn't really brought about a sure. positive change in the Middle East. Uh, in fact, what we must be wary of is when we think that something that is driven by an algorithm is actually people acting in their own interest. It isn't. It's mm -hmm. somebody else maneuvering and manipulating the system much better. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, 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 there was mention of Cold War. I would take a Cold War over a hot war any day. And, 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 and in a way, it would be good if we can, we can somehow have a, a, a China-America understanding uh, over sort of limits that they will observe. My fear is that nobody knows what the limits are. The rise of China was made possible by the promise of China. Mm. The assumption was China is going to become economically more prosperous and therefore it will also become more democratic. That assumption has turned out to be wrong. It hasn't become more democratic. It hasn't become open. And so what we have right now is multiple centers of power. But more important than that, the United States wanting actually to retrench from the world. The US has had two successive presidents, one from the left and one from the right, both wanting less involvement with the world. Um, President Obama thought that America's influence in the world is not necessarily for the good, so let's get out. Trump's view is, who gives a damn about the world? And so let's get out. So the net result is the same. America's leadership of the world has relatively diminished. Second. And that's a bad thing? I, I, well, I, I'm not, again, I, I don't want to get into your little bad thing, good thing. No, I'm no, just pointing just out what your, it is. Your, I just want to know and, your view about no, my, the matter. In, in, my opinion, I, in my opinion, it's not about good or bad. It's just understanding that the structures we, have, we are familiar with are, are collapsing. Are collapsing. Second, the international order that was built after the Second World War also had certain assumptions. Mm. Five countries were made custodians of global peace, the Security Council, Permanent Five. Well, uh, for a long time, that order was undermined by the fact that China was represented by tiny Taiwan until 1974, instead of real China. No. Second, France, which I don't think has any significant role in global uh, order in the same way as it could have had uh, at the end of the Second War. That's, and, and new powers have not been recognized mm. because the system is such that you need so many people to agree to it that that system is not being reformed. So you have an unrealistic system again, a bit more like what was the League of Nations uh, before, the, uh, 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 before the Second World War than the reality of the world. Lastly, the non-proliferation regime in the mm. nuclear uh, 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 respect. Also depended on five countries having nuclear weapons. But guess what? North Korea has nuclear weapons. India has mm. nuclear weapons. Mm. Pakistan has nuclear weapons, and probably Israel has nuclear weapons, and Iran wants to get them. So my point is essentially, again, without getting into the good and the bad, I'll let you uh, sort of uh, uh, get, get into that. I will focus on the fact that the, our discussion is about world order, and I'm just, I just want the audience to go home thinking that maybe we are entering into an era in which there will be less order in the world than we have known in our entire lives. And James's point that China and what China wants will shape what is going to happen to the rest of the world a lot more than our familiar patterns of understanding of the world. Right, picking that up from uh, where Hussein le left it off, 
I'm, I'm going to question this because there has been this narrative that since the Second World War, for a long time, we've had a long era of peace, relative peace, because there were these custodians of the world. Uh, this is a, I, I, I suggest that this is a very Euro, North American centric view, because there has been strife and struggle in large swaths of the world, which are the hinterlands of, of international order, uh, where you know people are suffering, where there's huge inequalities, where there's oppression, where there's no democracy, uh, and to keep an artifice of order over this is like a veneer, an artificial veneer, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, which is why I talk about good and bad. Uh, so, you know, a world order is not a cosmetic, uh, uh, you know, an objective kind of uh, academic kind of uh, reality. It is lived lives of people. If you look at the lived lives of people in Africa, in Asia, in, in, in large parts of, uh, you know, even some of the European countries which have emerged into uh, liberal democracies, uh, you, you can see the, the strife and the struggle and, and therefore this whole flux. Uh, John, how would, how would you look at something like this? Do you think having, you know, the, you know this uh, uh, pacification, a kind of pacified world is, is all that matters? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what your question was there, um, but 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 uh, I, I mean I, I fully agree with Hussein. These these are, 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 are perilous times, um, and we don't know actually what's going to happen in the next. I mean, if we think back, do we know? If we think back 20 years ago and think we couldn't imagine the situation that it is now, so how we can project through the next 20 years? I don't know. Um, I, I'm, uh, in, in the case of China, I mean, this is a very important issue, and I don't think uh, the world really understands China at all. Um, my experience of China as a writer of history is that the Chinese uh, uh, have always been very interested in their immediate neighbors, but have never taken the great interest in the wider world beyond them. And, uh, and I'm not even sure that the Chinese uh, leadership at the moment really knows what they're doing in the wider world. What they would like is recognition as a great power, whether, that, whether just uh, discussions on trade and uh, easing of trade restrictions and so on is going to uh, produce that. I don't know. I think they want to be involved more in world councils, in like, as Hussein was saying, a, a modern League of Nations. Mm. Um, and, and, and that sort of recognition might well diffuse the situation in, uh, say, the South China Sea or the relations with Taiwan and so on. Um, uh, we haven't even mentioned the, the, the great Chinese um, road and what do you call it? The Belt and Road? Belt the Belt and Road. <laughs> when I was at school, the definition of a pessimist was someone who wore belt and braces mm -hmm. <laughs> to hold their trousers up. Well, the Chinese have come up with this, with this um, um, amazing uh, Belt and Road scheme, which uh, the rest of the world has looked on uh, as with rather raised eyebrows. But I, I think, you know, we should, we should engage with them. It's a wonderful initiative. Um, and uh, instead of being so pessimistic about every move made by the Chinese leadership, we should try and work out what they're trying to do and how we can all engage with it and profit from it. That's excellent. Uh, John, would you say... With looking at China and the region, the, one can see the initiatives that are taking place in China. Uh, apart from the Silk and Belt Initiative, uh, the, the, the South China Seas, South China Seas, uh, in Sri Lanka, for India, this is important. The Hambantota port, Maldives, uh, Chinese role vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan, the Pakistan-China axis. How would you see this geopolitically and strategically? Uh, you know. For India, in India's interest since we're in India, mm. and also generally playing out. Well, I mean, I think John made a good point about the risk of great powers as they decline often make mistakes because they sort of dig their heels in in areas of, you know, where they don't want to lose face. Um, they're used to the world operating in certain ways, and therefore they pick battles that are unwise. Um, and the risk is that the United States will do that. But there is a risk on the other side. Um, so the Belt and Road Initiative is often seen as this magisterial uh, expression, international expression of Chinese power, where you see maps of the world which have these arrows on them, one of them going from the Chinese um, western hinterland down through Pakistan to the sea, another one that goes all the way across to Europe. There's six of these 
and then you have them going up. But and basically, China's making it up as it goes along. It doesn't really know what it's doing internationally. It is only just getting to the point where it is developing the kind of international capabilities that a country like America has had. You know, the, the cadres of people who go off to Zimbabwe and Zaire and Venezuela and learn about these other countries. And so it's perfectly possible that China will also make mistakes. The Belt and Road Initiative has been you know, it's won some friends, but also put a lot of people's backs up to the point that the Chinese leadership now are backtracking on that and not mentioning it very much. But let me make one final point, which is I think there is a danger. Um, I mean, you have elegantly linked together these issues of democracy and changing geopolitics. There is a danger we become too gloomy about the prospects for democracy. I mean, Xi Jinping's decision to give himself a third term was in a sense quite a clarifying moment because it meant that there could be no doubt as to what kind of regime China was. China is regressing to become a neo-Leninist autocracy. There were people around the world who could have kind of kidded themselves that China was a kind of managed democracy that just happened to be exceptionally good at building bullet trains. And that was something that some people in India, you know, there's an envy, particularly in South Asia, of the capability of these autocratic East Asian nations as they build trains and roads in a way that you simply can't in a messy democracy. Nonetheless, if I was to make a bet with you, Chairman, as to which of these two countries, India or China, is going to have the same political system in 50 years' time, I'd pick India every time. I mean, if China is going to become a rich economy as a neo-Leninist autocracy that is becoming less open, less market-orientated, and more internationally aggressive, that's going to be the first time that that's happened in history. The only countries that become rich are oil emirates and democracies. And so China is trying to do something very radical. And so certainly in India, you know, I'd still be reasonably confident that having a democracy is probably the best way to become rich in the long term. Suki, would you like to add anything to this? Well, I might be a pessimist, I think. I mean, because when it comes to North Korea, it just nothing mattered. You know, not, it's just been consistent. And I think the one big thing that people all forgot because of this whole, in a way, uh, uh, PR moment of happy Korea, two Koreas happy together, uh, song and dance we had all through the last year leading to now, with Trump aiding the process, is that Moon Jae-in declared very specifically the policy towards North Korea is changing. What he said was that Korea will be two different nations, meaning before that, they always talked about reunification. Moon Jae-in specifically said two nations. What that means is there is no reunification, even in a fantasy. What that also means is finally North Korea is being recognized as a legitimate nation. But what does that mean? That means North Korea is different from other nations. It is a rogue state where people are imprisoned in a, a state of persecution that is unfathomable. And what that meant was, for the sake of democracy in the region, and Moon Jae-in's own presidency, and also Trump, for his own agenda, Japan, um, Russia, all the surrounding nations, China, they all, in a way, are enabling North Korea, so that we can all pretend Kim Jong-un is a legit legitimate leader, and contain this as long as we can for the peace in the region. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with democracy at all, because there are actually 25 million North Koreans in it. I mean, I suppose the only point I was making, if you look around Asia, I don't want to be naive about this, the threats to democracy all around the world, in Europe, in North America, in this part of the world are real. Nonetheless, if you look at rich, successful nations, then the richest and successful nations in Asia are you know, either properly democratic, like South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, or sort of democratic, like Singapore, um, and there aren't any that are dictatorships. And so um, the sort of notion that you can power onwards, we're all very impressed by China's facial rec recognition technology and mobile payments, and you know, the, 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 there's a sort of technological uh, state that is developing there. Nonetheless, there just aren't very many examples in human history of countries growing rich with that sort of government. And so I don't think if you are a Democrat, as most many of you in this audience will be, I don't think you should lose confidence in the fact that democracy is not only a, a good system of, of government for people, it's also a good system of government for economic development. And yet we have seen what happens to democracies when they become authoritative. Like even in India, for instance, we have seen there are the other examples we cited. And in such cases, 
you have a process of democracy itself you know, being questioned. I think th th there's a whole question. I think that's, that's the real problem, is democracy in the dock in some ways. I mean, there's been some China bashing here, which is, I think, good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And I see a slight difference I, I in the way... Hear, I didn't hear let, any let China be, let, bashing. That's not fair. I no, think no. we heard there, some There has been some, some China yeah. bashing, I said. Uh, <laughs> meaning, uh, I think uh, uh, jo uh, John has a more, uh, uh, more balanced take on that. He thinks one should try and work with China, and China could actually make a difference, probably, in, in terms of the New World Order. At least that's what I, I think I heard you say. Um, John is a little more skeptical. Uh, James is a little more skeptical about that. He thinks China could become the... The, the, the big problematic as we go ahead in terms of values of democracy. Uh, I think Suki didn't refer to China, but was talking about North Korea. Uh, and, and she's, I mean, North Korea is obviously a rogue, I mean, is a rogue state, There's, it's a problematic state. But the point is, even in democracies, we are seeing people are electing. It's not as if people, there's coups and people are coming to power through, you know, uh, through force. People are electing authoritarian regimes. Uh, it's happening in Turkey, it's happened in the Philippines, it's, happening, it's happened in India. We have Modi's India is hardly uh, the, the best kind of democracy in practice. Uh, we have, uh, you know, ethnocentric kind of forces. We have streets, mob, uh, a lynch kind. Of, it, it's been called a lynch nation very often. We have that kind of mentality, uh, you know, ruling democracy. So what kind of democracy is this? The tyranny of the majority uh, is, is a small comfort if you, if you say you're in a democracy. Well, first of all, let me push back on three things that you have said. Any critique or criticism of China is not China bashing. That's a very Chinese view, that any criticism of them, <laughs> that if you criticize us, if you criticize Xi Jinping, if you criticize a more Leninist approach that has been adopted in China more recently, then that's somehow China bashing. We love China. Uh, we I'm love the world, <laughs> we love humanity, but we do have the right to criticize the political system and that is not China bashing. Second, I will push, you back, push back also on your assertion that the last 70 years, yes, but underneath everything, uh, uh, there was a lot of problems. Yes, there was, but let us be honest, the world did not have anything comparable to the First World War. It did not have anything comparable to the Second World War. Even all the various conflicts, etc. Even after that, I think more human beings live in relative, relative, and again, it's all relative, relative prosperity than they did 70 years ago. So these 70 years worked out okay for humanity. What we are concerned about is that the global order always needs adjustment, correction. Human beings have to improve their condition. And democracy also needs improvements. The fact that you, democracy is not major, majoritarian rule. Democracy is recognition of the rights of the minority also. What we are seeing is that all of a sudden these authoritarian and autocratic leaders are using democracy to deprive the minority of their rights. And what we need, so, so what I would say is that we need three major course corrections. Within democracies, People need to push for the rights of the minority as much as the rights of the majority. Let the majority have its way, but also give the minority its say. So let's guard against authoritarian leaders, whether in Hungary, whether in India, whether in wherever else. Second, I think we need to preserve world order. And we need to put up a fight for that, that the structures that have been built through human experience, they need to be improved. They don't need to be demolished. Mm. We need to deal with rogue states rather than say, okay, that's one little place. The lives of those people, well, price to pay, not, not acceptable. I think we need to stand for that. And people like Suki make a contribution there by alerting us constantly to what's going on in places like North Korea. And third, we need to s recognize that just as when America was the rising superpower, and many of us were critics, you know, uh, of their behavior, it is okay to criticize the behavior of the new rising superpower because that's how you keep the world in balance. Let there be order, but don't let that order be a kind of totalitarian and authoritarian system within countries and between countries. That would be my humble submission. How do you see the whole uh, <laughs> manner in which 
there's this huge inequality that is, uh, you know, growing, in fact, in democracies. You said relatively there's been a betterment of life. That arguably Piketty and others would say that, you know, there's been a greater divergence of incomes in, in, in democracies in recent times. Uh, you will find this sliver of very, you know, of oligarchs, literally, who, are, uh, who have nothing to do with the reality of the land. It's most, I think, acute in probably the UK and the US, but all democracies seem to be, that seems to be the aspirational model, literally. Uh, if that's a kind of paradigm, is that sustainable? What does it do to the vast, uh, you know, mass of humanity, and what are the values that are implicit in this? Well, this, this is my favorite subject, so this is what my book's about. So, um, it's not, so the UK hasn't actually got more unequal, um, but India has, and so has China. And so I'm not sure that there's a very, there's not a linear relationship between democracy and inequality. Um, many countries around the world, regardless of their systems of government, have got more unequal. And actually autocracies in general, if you look at the Middle East, I'm sure North Korea, you know, these are places of spectacular inequality. The most equal countries in the world um, are mostly democracies, you know, look, look, at, look at Japan, look at uh, the Scandinavian countries. So anyway, I, I don't think that there is a, um, a, a, a kind of Even linear relationship Japan, there, but talking I think about you originally started talking about globalization, and so for those of us who, as Hussein said, the last 20 or 30 years, for all of the other problems of the American-led world order, augmented by China latterly, it has been spectacular for the reduction of poverty the, uh, around the world, um, you know, there are 700, 800 million people who are no longer living in poverty. The global open order that is now coming under threat has delivered, um, you know, not so much if you're an American steel worker, but in spades, if you're a Chinese farmer, and increasingly an Indian farmer, where you know, the, the levels of absolute poverty in India have fallen much more quickly than people give it credit for. And the problem is that after the financial crisis, those of us who believe that there is much to recommend this model of integrated open globalization have made a complete hash of trying to come up with policies that will help people who have been left behind, um, that will be able to uh, roll back increasing inequalities in the countries that it have come to. And so this is a, a policy failure, and unless you know, policies are introduced of the sort that have meant that some of the Scandinavian countries have been more inured to this, then, you know, th this, is, th this is why people are so unhappy. But I don't think there's anything per se about democracies that make them more unequal. I don't think I suggested that. I was just saying there's a new manifestation of unequal, you know, unequal growth of distribution problems in democracies, which seems unprecedented in some manner. In, in, in terms of the stark, uh, you know, inequalities. Uh, and that, that probably is also another problem that adds to democracies. This may be a good point to, to open this up because we have another 10 minutes or so. So if there are questions, please raise your hand and uh, try and speak once you have the microphone with you. Yeah. The, yeah. We have many hands. Who, who's got the microphone? Can you? I can't see you. All right, carry on. Who, whoever's got... Okay, carry on. We'll start with you, then I'll come yeah, to you, Ram, you. and then we'll go. Yeah. Thank you so much for a wonderful and very enlightening dis discussion. And talking about authoritarian leaders being elected through democratic processes, elections, uh, I'm reminded of what Karl Popper called the paradox of democracy. If a, if a majority thinks that a demagogue must be elected, he becomes... I mean, he comes to power. So yeah. how do we change this? So uh, on, one, on, on one hand, Karl Popper said that what we need is strong institutions that can undo the damage caused. But uh, unfortunately, if you read the latest uh, two recent books that have come out, uh, I mean, How Democracies Die by uh, Stephen Levisky and uh, Daniel Ziblatt, and then the, the another book, The People Versus Democracy, these two books say that how democratic institutions are being subverted from within to allow demagogues to come to power. And without naming any nation, like everybody mentioned, they all they all around us. And of course, I want right. maybe my friend Hussein Akhani to comment on that. And that apart, people mention North Korea, but nobody mentions the rogue state of Israel. It has nuclear weapons. It has uh, it, it is it is undermining the rights of Palestinians. I think why is Israel not being brought into any conversation? Why even that needs to be? Question. Thank you. Hussein Saab, would you like to? First of all, I think that, uh, look, 
we have to always make a distinction between, you know, there's not, there isn't a perfect world at this point, and, and there hasn't been one before us. And John Kay would probably point out that, you know, it's unlikely, based on his knowledge of history, that there will be a perfect world. So among imperfections, then you always see what is worse. So Israel, you point out the Palestinian side of the equation, but for the, uh, uh, for the rest of the Israelis, Israel seems to work. And, and that's the difference between North Korea and Israel, that North Korea doesn't work for any North Koreans, you know. And, and, and that is the real reason why that distinction you feel. Doesn't mean people don't point out what's wrong in Israel, but they also notice the difference. It's, so it becomes, if something works for some, but not for all, that's a different subject. Uh, Sashi pointed it out very rightly, that you know inequality, for example. But then there's difference between inequality and lots of people dying of hunger or plague, which is not happening. Second point I would make is that when democracies elect a demagogue, what happens? Now, how, how do you get rid of it? Well, there's the part of the, of the institutions. But unless the entire process is subverted and a demagogue then makes himself Fuhrer, which only happened once, uh, usually there is the opportunity of a next election. So we have seen that in certain places, and we, we'll see in some of the other places. Unless they change the rules completely and say there will never be another election, demagogues do end up, or there is hope in this era, that they will be, uh, they will be voted out. And that, I think, is the hope for democracy in countries where the democratic system is strong, as James pointed out in case of India, but a election has thrown up a leadership with which many people disagree. Right. To, to safeguard yeah. democracy, the first thing you need to do is to ban, outlaw all referendums. <laughs> I, like Brexit. I live, I live in Scotland. We've yeah. had one, two, three, four, I think, in the last uh, five or six years. Yeah. And uh, they are a very, very bad idea in terms of dividing the electorate and in, in, and in terms of... Uh, making space for demagogues, as you were you hearing. Know, I have so a question ban on referendums. this one. Yes. Like, you know, when we're talking about democracy um, not working for all, right? It works for some, and then others have to suffer because of it. So in the case of Korea, the democracy uh, that was uh, made possible by all these people rising against Park Geun-hye government um, brought Moon Jae-in power in, yeah. but that democracy has now really, is going to enable North Korean, um, basically fall of North Korea. It's just going to, so the fact that democracy in South Korea is happening, but that's gonna result directly with sufferings of North Koreans. So right. how do we make sense of that? We're talking about world order mm -hmm. and liberal democracy and our vision of what will happen I don't know how one can justify that as having anything to do with a true sense of democracy. Right. It's interesting. Ram. This is a discussion on world order, and I, can't, I don't understand what is the real objection to President Trump's opening out his initiative with North Korea. I understand a certain obsession with their nuclear weapons, etc. But apart from that, isn't it a good thing? Shouldn't you give it a chance? Whatever we think of Donald Trump, that's completely different. But this particular initiative, what's really wrong with it? Uh, is it it's interesting, at least, if you don't want to commend it. Underlying this, I think, is a double standard, typical of liberal Democrats. I heard you say not, several times North Korea is a rogue state. I heard another person say, Israel is a rogue state, true. What about Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia's outrageous conduct in the whole neighborhood in connivance with the United States, the same Donald Trump administration, and also what happened to Khashoggi. Why doesn't that figure in any discussion of uh, the world order or what democracy is all about? Would you like to respond to that? Rogue, is it Saudi Arabia a rogue state as much yeah. in, in a different way? What, what could be wrong with what Trump is trying to, the kind of uh, initiative in North Korea? You think it's tokenist, nothing is coming out of it. Well, because there is, it's actually, um, there's no substance that we have, um, the, literally there's nothing that we can point a finger at as having um, done anything to improve the relation except it seems like it. So this is, I think the, uh, I mean, the summit itself, 
no one can tell what actually happened at that summit. And we've been talking about it for about a year of this um, Korea's finally happy, but on what grounds? So when we're saying what's wrong with it, it's because there is actually no substance. And we're talking about a really a serious issue. What it has done is sort of prolong it and legitimizing the regime. And the legitimizing the regime comes at a cost of uh, a gigantic suffering because what's happening in North Korea, there is actually degrees of, when we're talking about rogue state, there are degrees. And I believe North Korea, it's not my personal opinion, I think it's surpassed uh, uh, the, most, the biggest violations of, right. against humanity. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, as someone who's been interested in geostrategy for quite some time, I, uh, this is a question to anyone in the panel. Uh, we're talking about a new world order, we talk about China, we talk about various nations, but I think we constantly have a blind spot which is of great concern, especially in this region for us, and that is Russia. I think when we talk about anything geostrategic, Russia is closer to us geographically, but I mean, when I say yes, I mean India specifically and other Southeast nations, and we cannot uh, kind of uh, not delve deep is what I would say, into President Putin's intentions, his ambitions, his vision for his own country. So could someone on the panel uh, talk about the new world order factoring in Russia? Thank Anyone you. Anyone wants to feel that? Yeah. Actually, I'll respond to Mr. Ram's comments about Saudi Arabia and yours in the same way. Look, when you have a panel for an hour discussing the world order, actually we can't go through a whole sort of uh, a, a laundry list of ye bhi kharab hai, this is also bad, this is also bad. So I think we covered the waterfront. There are threats to democracy, there's threat to the system and structure of internationalism that was created after the Second World War, and there is prospect as well. There is chance to try and engage with everyone. There's great potential for India and China to work out things between themselves that will work out for maybe stability for Asia. But right now there's a moment of many questions. and. Russia is in the same position because President Putin, again, has created certain levels of uh, unpredictability. He wants Russia to have the same level of, shall we say, international attention and uh, centrality as it did when the Soviet Union existed uh, without the means that the Soviet Union had. And so, therefore, it is important to engage everyone. It's important to check every box and talk about every subject. But I'm afraid it can't be done in an hour as... Uh, 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 Mr. Kumar is going to find out from the organizers who will say we went too long. Yes, sir. <laughs> we have uh, time for perhaps no. two more questions. Yeah. Uh, this uh, whole uh, idea of how uh, dictators or leaders are uh, using the democratic system to control people is something very interesting. And I have a very uh, uh, question because if you notice, there are two trends. One is that people are controlling uh, emotions through religion. You know, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Turkey, and the leaders, are, they, you have very good orators who try to control people, manipulate people's emotions through a religion. And on the other hand, you have China, Russia, uh, US, where they're controlling emotions by say, talking about patriotism and nationalism. Now, how does a democratic system uh, you know, ensure that people's emotions are not manipulated so that you can have these great orators uh, come and manipulate emotions and then uh, become dictators. That's a big ask, but would <laughs> anyone like to? <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose that gets you back to the distinction between a, a proper liberal democracy and an illiberal democracy. The, the, it, whether it's India or any of the other countries the chair has mentioned, the liberal part, namely the rights that are afforded to all citizens and in particular to minorities, rights of freedom of association, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Uh, I mean, you see this in India spectacularly with the debate over women entering temples over the last few weeks. I mean, those are critical. And if you have regimes in which uh, religion becomes a force for majoritarianism, as opposed to being protected by liberal rights, then, then that is problematic. Um, and, and so I think it, it simply strengthens the case that democracy in the sense of the formal procedures of democracy, elections and so what, but also liberal rights properly go together and in situations where that doesn't happen, then it's minorities that suffer. Yes, sir. 
he and then he and then we'll have to stop yeah sir we have long back come from separated religion from politics that is the world order now i understand now unfortunately india seems to revert back to the combination of religion and politics and a particular religion is considered to be nationalism those who fall apart from this concept as termed as anti nationals so this is a new term so that means many of us are anti nationals the definition so i want to post this question to panel i think we are agreed on that do, do we have any difference of opinion i think uh, I, i don't think anybody approves of what's happening even in india at the moment in terms of uh, fomenting religious strife and the tyranny of the majority and using religion as a facade for you know you know keeping oneself in power yes sir so i would like to address some comments made by someone in israel first before i ask my question so uh, you think that israel is a rogue state but it was formed as a legitimate country and every time israel has to attack uh, the palestinians it's in defense only and you know th there there will be some palestinian aggression before that and that's why israel has to defend it so and uh, you know if you are talking about extremism in israel then you must talk about uh, the genocidal thoughts of uh, the palestinians uh, you know they call the mass execution of the jews and driving the jews into the sea and things so on and you you really uh, put that put that behind the curtains and present a image that this right. is the rogue i think state. you made the point the question so uh, why should we need a new world order uh, when we you know is it, is it about uh, the transfer of power from nation states to an international government or a, or like that does a new world order mean transcending na nation states and getting into a global order is that the yeah, question yeah, yes yeah transferring power from nation states transferring power from nation states to a global to a international government yeah. is, there, is there a response to that i don't think so i think for example there are many people in this audience where we have order and that order is basically respecting each other and recognizing that we can all sit in our individual seats have different opinions one gentleman has one opinion of israel you have another i have a third one which is in the middle of the two of you so that order does not mean imposition of somebody's uh, 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 authority over everybody else order basically means agreeing to rules of the game and i think that the world did agree to certain rules of the game for example the uh, the uh, universal declaration of human rights recognized certain rights uh, the international system has created structures of how and under what circumstances conflict is permissible and not and basically what we are talking about is how that particular order that has lasted for the last 70 years is cracking and that's what this discussion is about it's not about transferring power to you know it's not like the five of us are planning how to take over the world <laughs> no, i'm afraid and, we, and, can't, and, we can't we can't have a fall internationalism it's, it's does not happen. mean internationalism does not mean that there is a cabal that wants to take over and run the world notwithstanding what you read on the internet about a internationalist cabal running the world and 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 the illuminati is not about to take over the <laughs> world so don't worry too much I'm about afraid, it i'm afraid no time for a follow up i'm sorry no time for a follow up since you're on your feet sir the very last question of the session sir if i make the statement that in addressing the world order you have completely obfuscated the legacy issues that have bogged the world order right from the problems that the league of nations caused to the world order we are still simmering with the legacy issues right what has happened is politically it has been a non starter whereas economically there has been a lot of multilateral agreements and uh, that led to prosperity an increase in prosperity if you say but on the critical issues that had governed the world right from the 19th century in fact the problems of the middle east in fact the problems of the indian subcontinent all of them i would say Uh, or even between japan and china they are all legacy issues and we are doing nothing about it and is there any force in the world order or do you think the un system as it is crumbling down would have the capability to sort these legacy issues you have the last word john the leaden baggage of history <laughs> handle that I just, i'm sorry i didn't hear the question but <laughs> 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 well i think he was saying that we haven't looked at 
what the legacy is, you know, what we have imbibed as a legacy. And we can't talk about an emerging world order unless you come to terms with what the legacy is and the complications and complexities and the, 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 the baggage of that legacy. The legacy of the, of the 20th century we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Colonialism. Oh, colonialism. Oh, yes. <laughs> I can talk about that all evening. <laughs> um, uh, I, think, I think we are coming to terms with it. I was just thinking this has been an interesting occasion uh, in that I think it's one of the few panels I've been on where uh, uh, there hasn't been any mention of the colonial legacy and, uh, and the, uh, 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 the responsibility of uh, some nations for the plight of others. Um, and uh, this is, we haven't even mentioned Pakistan. I can't believe I've been on a panel in, in India where no one's mentioned Pakistan once, I don't think. Um, so this is, this is very refreshing. Things, things are changing. People are thinking differently and uh, are less concerned with the colonial legacy and are looking more to the future. And I think that's all very positive. Um, but uh, I mean, otherwise your question really deserves a book and I can't uh, write it in uh, a matter of seconds. But thank you. Uh, th thank you for reminding us of it. I think we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much. This has certainly been an interesting discussion. I hope we haven't obviously been able to be as exhaustive as some of you would have liked. Some of the examples have had to be selective. But thank you very much, all the participants. And thank you for your patience oh, well past your lunch time. Thank you. May I please request you not to crowd the authors as they leave the stage. They will be available for interaction and book signing outside to the right of the auditorium. That is near Coffee Day and the other kiosks. Another announcement, a pair of spectacles have been misplaced some somewhere in the auditorium. If anyone happens to find one that doesn't belong to you, kindly hand over to me backstage.